Good evening, everyone. I'm talking too loud. My name is Sherry Booth, and I'm the Associate Vice President of Philanthropy and Alumni Engagement. And I'm so excited to be here tonight and see all the friendly, familiar faces back out at our Community Speaker Series. So welcome. As we gather tonight, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe. And as I was walking over and we saw the Otonabe River and we saw the students swimming bravely in that river, you know, we think of the first people and, and how they've taught us to care for our lands. And we couldn't be at a better lecture here tonight uh, discussing and learning about our lands and, and learning from the elders and the first people. Um, on behalf of Trent University, I want to welcome you. But I'd like to take a moment and uh, tell you about Dr. David Shepard, who uh, is generous to Trent, to the, our students, to Peterborough, and we're here tonight thanks to him. Now, David Shepard came to Peterborough in 1985 as the founder and president of AL Stainless, Inc. He served in the community in many areas, including being the chair of our United Way board, which is a big uh, charity in town, of course. He worked with the skills development programs in Peterborough and throughout Ontario. Now, an uh, uh, important figure in his life was Jim Laval, commander of the Apollo 13, who once said, Earth is a precious and fragile place. Handle with living care. And these words inspired David Shepard uh, and leading him to create this lecture series. The Shepherd family was concerned with worldwide environmental deterioration and were enthusiastic about Trent creating, at that time, the Environmental Resource Center in the 1990s, which is the precursor to our current Trent School of the Environment. Mr. Shepherd passed away in 2003, and his legacy leads, leads on here uh, through the important environmental research underway at the university, and his memory is shared with us today. Gifts like Mr. Shepard's help make Trent University an incredible place to teach and learn, and uh, we're so thrilled that he has supported it in this way. I'd like to acknowledge and thank Dr. David Shepard and his family for their support of Trent and their beliefs in our students and the care for this planet. And now I'd like to call on Dr. Stephen Hill, the director of our Trent School of the Environment, who is going to do a special presentation this evening and uh, introduce our, our speaker tonight. And I must say, I'm thrilled to have an alumni home to speak with us this evening. Was it for me? Was it plus? <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Sherry. It's uh, great to see folks here and to, to have a, the, the chance to have this lecture tonight. It's my honor to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Keith Stewart, 86. Uh, and welcome him back to his alma, mat alma mater. And I've heard a number of people saying uh, he is, there's a lot of uh, people that know you, and it's great to, to have that connection. Uh, I know Keith as Climate Keith. Uh, across the country, he's uh, well known and needs no introduction to the environmental community because of his uh, work and, and thought, le his leadership and thinking around energy and climate policy. Um, he's an award-winning and respected environmental analyst, and he's devoted his life to pursuing climate justice. And he's currently the senior energy strategist with Greenpeace Canada. Um, he's worked and volunteered for many other organizations, including OPERG and the World Wildlife Fund, the Toronto Environmental Alliance. Um, he did a lot of great work on the Kyoto Protocol and um, the Low Income Energy Network, which is really important in looking at uh, energy affordability and the Clean Air Partnership. He's led nationwide campaigns and served as a key voice against development and funding of oil and gas pipelines. Um, his work was really important in phasing out the coal-fired electricity generation here in Ontario. Um, and he's also the co-author of Hydro, which is one of my, uh, a great book. I, I think you can still get it from Between the Lines Press uh, and with co-author with uh, Jamie Swift, uh, which is a history of the, the rise and fall of Ontario Hydro. 
Um, he's sought out by media across the country for his opinions and for his writing, including the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, the National Post, the CBC. Uh, so people uh, you know, really want to know what Keith thinks about these things. So we're grateful for that, when, for him to be here to share it with us. When he was at Trent, he was uh, earned the uh, Berna Theol Theobaldus. Theobalds? Okay, he earned, uh, and, and the John Hillman Prize. So two academic prizes in international development studies um, for his academic work. So congratulations. So any students here who are wondering about their academic awards, they stay with you. Uh, uh, but he also came full circle when he returned to Trent as the, uh, with the Trent and Ecuador program and coordinating that in 1995, and then as an instructor in 1999 and 2000 um, in, in the... Uh, uh, environmental policy and environment and development, and so coming back to teach here. Um, so he's had a lot of remarkable accomplishments and they've not gone, gone unnoticed. He was named the best green activist by Now Magazine and a green giant by Toronto Life. Uh, not one to rest on his laurels, though. One of the nominators for an award that we'll mention in a second said, if Keith were to answer the question, what impact have you had, his response would be, not enough yet. So I'm really happy to welcome you back to campus. It's been, uh, it's a real honor to have you here. And um, before you, I ask you up to, for your, your speech to hear from you, we have a very special presentation. And based on his extensive accomplishments, the Trent University Alumni Association chose Keith as the 2023 recipient of the uh, Distinguished Alumni Award. And that board has been presented for over 20 years to alumni such as uh, writer Jan Martel, Roar Rob Marland, and physician James Urbinski. So you're in good company. Um, so I'd like to ask Sherry to come up and uh, we'll, we'll award this Distinguished Alumni uh, Award to you. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, well done, well earned. Thank you so much. Well earned. So without further ado, let me welcome you up uh, to the front. Thanks very much for being here. So thank you so much for inviting me back to my alma mater. I'm not sure how you pronounce that in Latin, but I'm going to go with that. Um, and I really want to thank the family of David Shepard for putting on this lecture series. I looked at who else had been giving these lectures, and I'm like, oh, they probably knew the answer to the question before they sent in the title of their talk. <laughs> Note to self. Um, Trent was, of course, I think for, like, for a lot of people in the room, incredibly formative for me. Uh, I learned so much from some great professors, uh, like Lynn Davis, who I actually just was emailing back and forth with uh, today. Um, uh, John Hillman and Dan Powell, who unfortunately are no longer with us. Um, Bill Hunter, who was like an amazing economics professor. I learned so much from him, including like why a lot of economics is silly, which you don't usually learn from economics professors. And uh, pretty Bandi Apajai, who uh, I will always remember when he handed back the first assignment in the course, he said, some of you are gonna look at your grade and think you should drop this course. <laughs> that would be wise. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I also learned an enormous amount just from the community of activists in this city. Uh, I wasn't involved in activism before I came to Trent, and this is where I really first got my taste of it. It clearly agreed with me. Um, people like Linda Slavin, who is here tonight, I'm so excited to see. I'm going to talk about this naming the moment processing. Linda was actually part of the workshop that we did with that. Um, 
Uh, and of course, uh, Clifford Maines, who taught me a lot about organizing. And when I started working at the Ontario Public Interest Research Group, I was basically like, Clifford, what am I supposed to do? Um, and like I think, uh, like so many of us in university, I learned a lot from my fellow students. Um, some of whom are even here. Like I just saw Ray Dart sneak in with food, and I'm like, he used to steal free food all the time. <laughs> uh, but in particular, uh, they, they couldn't be here tonight because they're both traveling, which is a good thing for me because they promised to sit in the front row and try and make me laugh the whole time. But uh, my good friends and former roommates, Danny Wong and Stephen Couchman, who nominated me for this award. Um, so thanks to them. I feel very honored and very, very old. Uh, as I was preparing this, I was suddenly like, really, that long ago? How did that happen? Um, I do, however, feel the generosity of the invitation and the award necessitates a certain amount of honesty. And I have to confess that uh, <laughs> in my four years at Trent, I never actually took a course in environmental studies. Uh, I was in what was then called comparative development studies, now would be called in international development studies. It was an internationally program. I took a lot of economics, politics. The thing I think most valuable with IDS was it really stressed looking at the historical roots of problems. Um, and I didn't take environmental studies. I had lots of friends in environmental studies. They were tree huggers, lovely people. A lot of them were getting arrested up in tomogamy. I didn't quite understand what was going on there. Um, but uh, I really regret that now because I wish I had taken those courses. But I do think that Trent's environment really prepared me for doing what I'm going to talk to you about, the stuff that I do. Um, and I got to come back and teach in the program, which was wonderful. Uh, and I really liked it. And I just wish the commute wasn't quite as far for coming to teach at Trent. Uh, and I still teach at uh, the University of Toronto. Um, now, in the 1980s, when I was at Trent, um, I thought environmental studies was about, you know, maybe wilderness preservation or recycling, um, and that's all it was. And I realized I was wrong. Um, and part of what I'm going to talk about tonight is learning from our failures, our mistakes, because as someone who spent his entire adult life in a mostly losing struggle, I like to think we learn from our failures, um, because <laughs> otherwise it would be some days hard to get up in the morning. Um, so <clears throat> bear with me. I'm going to come back to my time at Trent, but I want to sort of jump back 10 and a half years to the moment of that photo. Um, uh, that is October 16, 2013. Um, and that's me with a fellow named Benjamin, um, who was locked to the front gate of the Kinder Morgan Oil Terminal in Vancouver. Um, Greenpeace was, this was before anyone had really heard much about the Kinder Morgan pipeline. That still hasn't been built and has gone in price from $5.6 billion to $34 billion and currently owned by the, we scared off the private company that was trying to build it. So the government nationalized it and is building it. Um, so, you know, if they would have listened to me in 2013, you and I would have saved ourselves $30.4 billion, which could have been much better spent on something else. Um, but I failed. <laughs> uh, the, so, when you do things like that, it's, it's incredibly stressful and you don't know exactly what's going to happen. And this whole thing was planned. So we had like, we had one team coming in by water in a Zodiac. We had another team going over a barbed wire fence. And we had two separate teams. So if one of them somehow got intercepted by security, the other could complete the task, which was to occupy the oil terminal, rappel down off of the oil tanks. So when the police show up, they can't actually get you because you're literally hanging from a rope below them. Um, and because I'm was then and still am kind of like the old guy, uh, I got the job of distraction. So my role, and Benjamin was there with me, I think they wanted Benjamin because they wanted someone young, um, <laughs> was to run up to the front gates at five in the morning and like chain ourselves to them with these fancy chains and these fancy locks purchased just for this purpose. Um, and we had been practicing, like we had literally been practicing by running across fields and like chaining ourselves to school fences. 
Um, so we could do it really fast because you wanted to get there before the security could notice you and be locked down. So by the time the guard got there, you were they couldn't get you away. Because we were locking the front gate so the police couldn't get vehicles in to try and bring in a cherry picker to pull people off. Great strategy. Important thing was speed. Get there, lock down. It was 45 minutes before the security guard noticed we were there. <laughs> I got to tell him that actually you currently have a 20 by 40 meter banner hanging off of one of your tanks and there's people rappelling down the other painting in like six meter high letters on it. Stop Harper. Um, it was not a good day for him. Uh, but uh, we were there, and we, so the goal was we were to get there, we were to like just stall, just get the security to come to us so the other people could get in, not notice, stall, probably taken away in an hour. Arrested, taken away. Um, except we had bought such fancy chains and locks that the RCMP chain, like, didn't have a saw that could cut through them. <laughs> so I ended up there for 12 hours. I'm 56 now, I would have been like, you know, like mid 40s then. Sitting on the cement in the cold, damp for 12 hours, chained to a fence so you can't move because literally you're chained there. Um, it's not comfortable. Uh, my back was soon hurting a lot. But mostly, I had a lot of time to think. Because <laughs> I didn't have a phone, right? You don't bring your phone with you so the police can't get your phone and then find out everything about you. Um, so Benjamin and I were chained to the fence. Benjamin, after a while, wasn't really talking much because his girlfriend phoned and broke up with him once she saw the news. No. Sorry, Benjamin. Um, uh, <clears throat> but I had 12 hours to think, and the thing that I started thinking about is, how did I get here? And then I started thinking about something I did at Trent. Um, called the Naming the Moment Project. Professor Lynn Davis of Indigenous Studies, she taught these amazing courses. I actually did a course on how to write a funding proposal. That is actually an incredibly useful course to take if you're gonna move into the nonprofit. Because I actually used to write funding proposals to pay myself. That's how I got to be able to be an activist. Um, but we did, this pro we did this thing with the Jesuit Center for Social Justice in Toronto where we would go down and we were doing this, learning this conjunctural analysis thing called Naming the Moment, which had been actually developed by the Jesuits. Um, Jesuits are an odd bunch, and some of them are like really progressive on some things. Um, so, and in the naming of the moment process, oh, actually, can I, how do I advance the thing? Is this it? Oh, so there's me changing the fence, but you already saw that because it was on the opening slide. Um, so naming the moment was a tool that they were developing for community groups to use. Uh, and I have come to like really embedded in my thinking because the interesting thing for me was it was what they called conjunctural analysis. Um, and for me, it brings together activism and the academy. Academics and activism and sort of the back and forth between them in a, how they can be used in a protractive tension. And um, in my memory of it, I actually managed to, I got Deborah Barnt, who was part of this process as well, to send me a PDF of it. And I suddenly realized my memory of it was not actually what it was. Um, but in my memory of it, which is close to what it was, there were three questions. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so you start by, first question is, how did we get here? Um, and that was a question I was thinking about change of that fence. And so I was thinking, how did, we, how, how did I get here? And it's like, but then that use of process, how did we get here? Um, second is, where is there open space? Um, and then third, what can we do together to end up in a better place? Now, each of these has a lot more detail, and there's a bunch of things, and a lot of, you end up with a lot of flip chart paper up on walls. Um, but for that first question, how do we get here, you really need to understand what is the history of this issue. Because if you don't understand the history of something, it's very hard to change it. You have to know where it came from. 
What are the important systems of power that shape it? Who benefits and who loses from the system? Who are the key players? What do the various players want? And how do they try and get it? Because different people have different kind of resources available to them that they can use to try and change the world. Um, Naming the Moment was built on a combination of the intellectual framework of Antonio Gramsci and the popular education methodology pioneered by Paolo Freire. Um, I've always had a soft spot for Antonio Gramsci because he did his best work academically while rotting in a fascist prison in wartime Italy as he tried to understand why the inevitable triumph of the working class was not quite so in inevitable. And he was basically in prison saying, how did I get here? And he wrote these things called the prison notebooks, which were smuggled out. Um, and the prison notebooks are a lot about learning from failure. And one of the things he discusses is what he calls the philosophy of praxis. He had to use fancy words, so he, when he snuggled, the things were being smuggled out, they didn't have the word marks anywhere in them. Um, but basically, it's a dialectic of action and reflection. And for me, this is also part of the dialectic between activism and the academy. Um, and there's that, that creative tension as you go back and forth between them. In university, you hopefully learn about historical systems, about how our current economy, politics, and culture came into being. Um, these systems come into being and are relatively stable because they work for somebody. Um, Usually powerful groups, currently in our world, it's things like oil executives, bankers, weapons manufacturers. It also works best for people like me, uh, white, cis, heterosexual men from the global north. Uh, these systems appear as natural, and, but they are historical creations that can be remade. And in the words of one of my favorite science fiction writers, which I think everyone should have to read, um, Ursula K. Le Guin, we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. So these systems that we're going to look at trying to change work for some people, but that means they are broken for someone else. Every system is broken for somebody. Um, and when you study these systems, you're trying to wrap your head around the complex interconnections, the various shades of gray, how they're historically situated. This is the reflection part of praxis. And that's the Navy Women's Pod, this step of how did we get here. Activism, however, is often about doing something. And we're often driven to activism because we think that there's something wrong with the world and we think something needs to be done and we don't necessarily know, but we just want to do something. Because there is something that is unfair, that is unjust, that isn't right. Um, and we cannot simply ignore that. And activism, in my experience, spans a broad spectrum from incremental change, which I like to think of as how do we get the best deal possible given the circumstances? And then at the other end, you've got sort of more radical change. How do we change the circumstances such that a, a better deal is possible. So what's the best deal possible given the circumstances? How do we change the circumstances so a better deal is possible? Um, this is sometimes posed as a choice between speaking in the language of social power or being a voice in the wilderness. But this isn't actually a binary choice. Activism is most effective when the two ends of the spectrum are connected in a creative tension through strategy. Um, this can happen, it doesn't always. Some kinds of incremental wins, getting what you think is the best deal, given the circumstances, can actually reinforce the system that is at the root of the problem. Um, so in the 1990s, as globalization and neoliberalism took hold, and I was graduating from Trent, um, in the environmental movement, there was a whole push to abandon that old-fashioned Stalinist, top-down regulation by governments in favor of, let's work with the market. Um, let's uh, use voluntary corporate initiatives, use the promise of green market niches as a carrot in place of a regulatory stick. And this did, in fact, allow some environmentalists to speak in the language of social power. 
to speak of the genius of free markets and the supremacy of consumer choice at a time when governments banning and planning and doing that kind of stuff was out of favor. The idea was to look for win-win solutions, good for the environment and good for the economy. Um, unstated is the fact that the economy, in fact, uh, is not neutral, what we think of as the economy. And saying something is good for the economy often meant it was good for certain people within that economy who are benefiting disproportionately from it. Um, and in practice, when we, as part of these multi-stakeholder negotiations that we did, it generally meant let's not do anything that anybody powerful objects to. When you limit the field of choice to things powerful people won't object to, you end up with what we got, which was the voluntary challenge registry. Anyone remember that? I think Ray does. I know Ray does. Um, Eco-labeling. Um, green consumerism. Uh, the intellect those intellectual gains, those incremental gains actually reinforce the system that was the problem. Um, on the flip side, so the problem, on the flip side, if you just say, I'm going to wait for the revolution, capital R, um, that isn't terribly productive either. Uh, so the trick, the hard thing, is how do you achieve and cement those incremental gains along the way that lead to change in the system? And that's a hard thing to do. Um, because big systems like capitalism, patriarchy, colonialism, or the fossil fuel economy are very complicated and interconnected. They also have a lot of inertia because they work for somebody. And those people tend to run the world. Um, and this is where the academy part is really useful because academics, what we do is we're good at understanding that complexity and understanding the interrelationships of those systems. Um, now, when I put on my little like Greenpeace hat and with an academic background, I look at these interconnected systems that have put our planet on the path to destruction and are keeping it there. And you know, my informed opinion as Dr. Keith Stewart is, wow, we're really screwed and there's not a lot we could do about it. We're really screwed and there's not a lot we could do about it. But not a lot is not nothing. This is stage two of the naming the moment process, identifying the open space. Where are there opportunities for transformation? The big systems we're challenging are so strong and stable because they benefit powerful groups, but there's always internal conflicts within any system. Um, there's new niches growing up in various places. These are cracks that can be widened, alternative systems that are taking root in those cracks that can be nurtured like weeds breaking up concrete. Um, if you believe weeds can't do this, come to my walkway of my house and watch it in action. Um, so at this stage, when we're trying to identify the open space, we look at, okay, what are those weeds that are breaking the system right now? How, do we, how can we nurture them? Who is with us and who is against us? Is there somebody that can be brought on side because there's this new thing coming into existence? Um, what resources do we have? What resources do the other side have? Does the other side have? Now, <clears throat> the key thing here, which as an academic, I and others are sometimes vulnerable to, is fall, to, the key thing is to not fall for what I like to call the belling the cat fallacy. When my kids were little and I have to read Aesop's fables to them, you know, written 2,500 years ago, I don't know if any of you have read them recently, or usually you just read them to your kids. You're suddenly like, wow, this guy's pretty freaking smart. Um, so the belling the cat fable, the way it works is the mice are all getting together and they're like, okay, the cat is eating us. How do we like keep the cat from eating us? And they have a meeting and you know, the smartest young mouse comes up with the plan, which is we're gonna put a bell on the cat so we can hear the cat coming and we won't both sneak up us and eat us. And everyone agrees this is a great plan. And then the oldest mouse sort of puts up his hand and says, it's one, th uh, who's gonna actually put the bell on the cat? Um, and the moral, literal moral, which they had at the end of each, each fable, if you recall, is it is one thing to say that something should be done, but quite a different matter to do it. 
And I often feel this, some, this way some, when someone says to me, the problem is capitalism. Yes, you are not wrong. It is helpful to name these types of big systems. Um, but saying the problem is capitalism doesn't necessarily help me as I'm getting out of bed in the morning and trying to decide what to do. In fact, if you say the problem is capitalism, uh, then it's a big incentive to not get out of bed at all. Um, so we've got to come at it sideways. And so I'm going to use a, a mechanistic metaphor, which is completely contrary to ecological thinking. And, uh, but I really like Charlie Chaplin's um, Modern Life. Everyone should go back and watch it. It's probably, what, a century old at this point, and it's just freaking brilliant. Um, but if you think of these big systems as a huge old-style clock with gears turning, um, you know, what are you going to do? Well, if you're, you know, the straw man, stereotypical activist, it's like pick up a hammer and just start banging the thing. And if you're the stereotypical academic <coughs> economist, um, you say, assume we have the right tool. Yeah. Um, I did take seven economics courses at Trent and did well in them so I can make economics jokes. Um, but if, however, you combine the two, if you name the moment, you're trying to identify the open space within that system, the weak spots, where we can stick in a metaphorical crowbar and push so a part of the system falls apart in a way that is useful. Um, the catch, relative to assume we have the crowbar, is that the crowbar usually isn't sitting there just lying around. Uh, you actually have to build the tool, usually, through this thing called organizing, which is slow and painful. And organizing has to begin with something that people already care deeply about, rather than something you wish that they cared about. Yes, here I am, in fact, throwing shade at carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is a useful tool, and it's important, um, but it should not be the only or even the main tool we use to try and address climate change because it actually incremental changes in prices isn't great for shifting systems, which require investments in infrastructure, et cetera. But also, nobody loves it, aside from economists. Um, and no one thinks, oh, this is really good for me. Um, and if it's your only answer, if it's the only tool you try and pick up and use, you're actually reinforcing big parts of the system that we're trying to change. Things like governments shouldn't actually make big decisions over the direction of the economy. Um, uh, now, it's an example of what I think of as trying to build a cat. And a lot of economists that I have engaged with on this, and some environmentalists, um, explain to me that you don't understand. Conservatives should love carbon pricing because it is a market mechanism and they are pro-market. Yet every influential conservative politician in the country endlessly rants on about the evils of the carbon tax. How could that be? And I think on some level, the conservative politicians understand it, that markets are social contracts that embody power relationships, not platonic ideals. And the key thing is, when markets serve and reinforce existing power relationships, conservatives are in favor of those markets because markets are social creations. Um, if markets uh, undermine contemporary forms of power, then they are not in favor of them. If you look at big chunks of our economy, they're all freaking monopolies, which is a certain type of market which economists will tell you is not the great type of market. It's not the right kind. But they exist because the people who run those monopolies have power, and they actually manage to hold on to their, that power. Um, so <clears throat> the thing, however, I think the real attraction of markets to a lot of people is, if you think like, oh, conservatives are going to like are pro-market, so they're going to love these market mechanisms, 
it's like we get to bypass politics. We just have to be clever and use the right words, and we get to bypass the need for politics. Um, and I kind of figured I wish, it, really wish I'd figured this out sooner. Um, but uh, that's not going to happen. Um, you don't get to bypass, bypass politics and power. Um, and when I look back on sort of that period and some of the organizing that we did, uh, and I look at the campaign, which actually was enormously successful in this country. Canada is more successful than anywhere else to actually embed carbon pricing as like the central piece of our climate policy. Um, and when you look at what's happening now, as I, I find myself having to defend carbon pricing, which is like, I would never have done this in the first place as a central thing, but I now have to defend it because it is so important to the existing system that we have while advocating for all the other stuff that we need, um, is when you are engaging in politics, complexity, the kind of thing academics as that we love, that I love, my coworkers occasionally get blank expressions as I go on about weird things and start showing a lot of graphs. Um, complexity is a tool and not a goal. Uh, we shouldn't be expecting everyone involved to take a graduate course on a topic to try and feel that they get to take part in changing the world. Um, and this is where the Paolo Freire popular education side of the Naming the Moment project is really useful. You have to start from where people are at and what they care about. And I was lobbying some politician one time. <laughs> I wish I had all these things. I should have written them all down at the time with the exact date and everything, because I'd love to have a, a record. But I just remember I was saying, Talk, lobbying him, something he's looking at. Nobody gets up in the morning and looks for new things to worry about. <laughs> um, and when it comes to organizing, the thing you learn is complexity is actually demotivating. If you try and explain everything to people, the problem just seems looks too big to even like get out of bed in the morning. Um, but also, they can think. This person doesn't seem to fully understand it. It's confusing. They, you must be confused. And so why would I listen to you or do what you asked me to do? Um, and the Germans, I don't know what the actual word is in German, but they have this expression that they call the red thread, which my German colleagues use, um, which is the important line that runs through a complex picture, place, or process. And a successful campaign to change systems has to follow that thread. Um, it's moves, it creates a series of open spaces along that thread and moves into them. So rather than trying to explain to people at the very beginning like why carbon pricing is so important or why, you know, like, uh, I, I won't try, try and give huge examples, but um, you want to show a way forward, a trail, a set of stepping stones that if you follow along, you're going to end up someplace better. And if you can, uh, you're creating a critical path that people can understand, okay, if I do this, this thing will happen. Um, if I do this next step, this thing will happen. And if they go with you on that first step and it works, they're more likely to come with you on the second step and have some confidence that you might know where you're going, so let's follow along. Because there are enormous numbers of people in this country who want to do something about climate change and don't know what to do. And sometimes when they ask environmentalists, we don't have a great answer for that. Because, like when I worked at the WWF, the day I started, I was brought down to the marketing person, who was a lovely person, knew how to market, was like a brilliant marketer, and it comes to WWF because they wanted to use their skills for good, and they were like, okay, they sat me down. What are the three things that anyone can do in the comfort of their own home that will stop climate change? And I was like, well, there aren't three things anyone can do from the comfort of their home that's going to stop climate change. And you're like, no, I don't, I don't think you heard me. What are the three things? But the thing is, you actually have to have, here are some things that you can do that are going to take us along that pathway. Um, saying we have to overthrow capitalism means people are likely to go back to bed. It's an entirely rational response. Um, uh, but if, you know, we've analyzed that complexity, understood how the system works in all its complicated glory, we might be able to, like, 
well, follow that thread through. And to go, or go back to my original metaphor, we can find or create the right tool to affect the machine that is in front of us. And if we build the right tool, then push on it in the right way, actually Charlie Chaplin never does this in the movie, um, and in the, push on it in the right way at the right time with enough force, then a part of the system is interrupted. And you kind of create an open space, a space where the system isn't working well right now. You occupy that space and then you have to like find the next point, whereas the next place you're gonna like throw in your crowbar and twist. The problem, however, is sometimes actually um, you don't need a crowbar for the next one, you need a screwdriver. So now you gotta go to all the trouble of making a screwdriver, metaphorical organizing. Um, but, you know, if the people who were with you on the crowbar, you now say, okay, we need a screwdriver, they're like, okay, who's got a screwdriver? Um, this is that process of action and reflection. This has all been horribly abstract, which is actually a terrible way to try and explain this to anyone. So I'm gonna try and make it a little more concrete. When I was chained to that fence back in 2013, um, I was thinking about, okay, what is the red thread that brought me to here to this moment? And there really were two specific times that came to brain, my mind. One was in 1990 and another in 2009. And in the spring of 1990, I was about to graduate from Trent, I had no clear idea of what I wanted to do with my life, and an evening not unlike this one, I went to hear some guy I'd never heard of talk about something I'd never heard of. And I think Linda Slavin was the one who told me to go. Um, that guy was Stephen Lewis. Um, if I Google had existed then, I could have Googled him and found out that he was the past leader of the Ontario NDP, um, he had been Canada's ambassador to the UN, and at the time he was doing this talk, he had just co-chaired the first ever major international conference which brought together scientists and politicians to talk about this thing that was then called global warming. Um, now, uh, that conference, you know, Brian Mulroney signed the statement that included this phrase. Um, it said that global warming posed a threat to human society second only to all-out nuclear war. Um, Stephen Lewis remains the best public speaker I've ever heard in my life. He spoke eloquently about the horrible fate that awaited us if we didn't do something about global warming, which again, I had never heard of. Um, there would be more ever more powerful storms, destroying homes and roads, longer and deeper droughts, devastating crops and fueling wildfires, rising sea levels, threatening coastal communities. And the point that he made that kind of like, for my 20 whatever year old self, he's like, the most horrible thing about this is the people who are gonna be hurt the most are the ones who have actually done the least to cause this problem. Um, he was in particular concerned with people in Africa. That was sort of his passion and he worked in Africa for many years on AIDS and other issues. Um, so I walked out of that hall and I think it was a high school in Tr Peterborough somewhere. Um, and I thought, well, somebody should do something about this. How long could it take? Um, I repeat, I'm feeling really old. Uh, so I ended up getting a job with the Ontario Public Interest Research Group here in Peterborough. I eventually went back to grad school and I studied, but the whole time I was in grad school, I was doing volunteer work and contract work and then eventually working full time in the environmental movement. Um, throughout the 1990s, people concerned about climate change and there weren't a huge number then, um, were facing a really well-funded, sophisticated campaign funded by oil, oil, coal, and car companies to cast doubt on the science. Um, in the words of the PR professionals who designed that campaign, and the exact same company and people, in fact, had ex worked on Big Tobacco's campaign to deny that cancer causes, uh, cigarettes cause cancer. Um, you know, in their words, doubt is our product. Because if you can cast doubt on the science, then it's very hard to get buy-in for big changes. Let's wait until we learn more. Uh, we're still hearing we should wait until we hear more. Um, and one of the fascinating things, I wrote a short thing on this and someday I'm gonna like write it up more and more length, but so many of the elements of post-truth politics 
perfected by Donald Trump, but so prevalent throughout the world, including with our own Pierre Polyev, um, were actually pioneered by the climate denial movement. Uh, for environmentalists, however, this debate, is the science real or not, ended up being kind of a trap. Um, it got us thinking that what we needed to be was really good debaters when we should have been building power. Now, I am a much better debater than I am a political organizer. Debating is a lot less work. And it's something I feel comfortable with. Um, <clears throat> and when I started engaging in climate politics fresh out of school, I thought it would be a little bit like a university seminar where the smartest person wins. And if we just got the right graph in front of the right person, the logic would be inescapable. Spoiler, the logic can be escaped. Um, it's another lesson from failure. Politics is, in fact, nothing like a university seminar. Although, of course, there's university politics, but that's none of the people in this room engage in that. Um, and in many cases, environmentalists were assuming the science would speak for itself. And indeed, often we would try and imagine that there were no sides. We're all in this together, even though there was another side that was just like beating the crap out of us in, on the political field. Um, and, you know, politics is about power. And science is a form of power, but so is money. And frankly, if you're taking bets, when science goes up against money, you might want to bet on money, <laughs> unless you can get something to back up your science. Uh, so the best advice I got on this was actually from a guy in the Chrétien government. He was an advisor to, senior political advisor to David Anderson when he was Minister of Environment. And I was lobbying this guy with the David Suzuki Foundation gang. And after listening to our spiel on the science of climate change and how the policy package, the 13-point plan to implement the Kyoto Protocol um, that we had. Why 13? I don't remember now. Um, you know, this policy package was in, in the public interest. And he turned and he said to me, Remember, this is a guy who's trying to help. He wants to do the right thing. He's like working for the environment minister. It's like, you're trying to sell me a solution when I don't think I have a problem. And we're like, excuse me, chart, data, science, IPCC report, you have a problem. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, he was like, will my side lose three seats if we don't do what you're asking? If you can convince me we're going to lose three seats if I don't do what you want, then I have a problem and I care about your solution. And as we're leaving, he said, and we, so we went through polling numbers, 82% of Canadians want action on climate change. Says, yeah, but they don't want it very much. <laughs> You don't see anyone getting arrested over climate change now, do you? His point that was that we were telling him there was a crisis, but we weren't acting like there was a crisis. We were trying to appear calm and reasonable so we could be taken seriously. But trying being calm in the light of the science was actually profoundly unserious. Um, and this is a lesson I was slow to learn, um, but it really kind of like struck home to me many years later when I was reading Naomi Klein's uh, This Changes Everything, was she writes, slavery wasn't a crisis for British and American elites until abolitionism turned it into one. Racial discrimination wasn't a crisis until the civil rights movement turned it into one. Sex discrimination wasn't a crisis until feminism turned it into one. Apartheid wasn't a crisis until the anti-apartheid movement turned it into one. The role of the environmental movement at that moment, or that sort of naming the moment was to turn this into a crisis, um, which we're still working on. Um, now, the reason that uh, I think had some trouble permeate the movement as it was at that time was to do with the kind of person attracted to climate policy advocacy. We tend to be hyper-rational, and sticking with an appeal to science is a very comfortable place. 
uh, my buddy Martin von Mierbach, who I worked with at WWF, great guy. Um, I remember one time he said to me, I don't get you climate guys. Us tree guys, you know, like the, the wilderness forestry guys, they're like, every one of us can tell you a moment of epiphany. That moment when we felt this connection to the natural world and we felt that we were called to defend it. You climate guys have graphs. Um, and that's sticking to the, with the appeal of science is a very comfortable place. So we wrote reports, we gave briefings, we attended international climate conferences, feeling like we were making a difference. And where that bubble really got burst was in 2009, that second point in my little red thread, um, at the climate, climate, Copenhagen Climate Conference. Now, you would have, wouldn't have seen any of this because all behind the scenes, but the environmental movement had spent years planning, building to that moment, that moment when those world leaders would be in that, at that conference with a particular agenda. This was the moment everything was going to change. We were going to get that global deal. We had a really good strategy. We actually had, you know, it was decently funded by a bunch of philanthropists. We executed that plan well. Not perfectly, nothing's ever perfect, but it was pretty damn well executed. And it failed. Utterly. Like, everyone walked away going like, what just happened there? Um, so after much reflection and more than a few emotional breakdowns within the movement, um, the conclusion many of us came to was that we simply didn't have the strength to match the lobbying power of the fossil fuel industry. This was due to their wealth and influence, but also on changing ideas regarding the role of business versus government. Um, and again, Naomi Klein, who, Naomi Klein happens to be the daughter-in-law of Stephen Lewis, which tells you just how small Canada really is. Um, you know, she talks about how the climate crisis emerged in the political scene just as globalization was taking hold and we were dismantling all the tools necessary to deal with it. Tools like industrial policy, which is actually now back in favor because of climate change. Um, governments banning and planning, dismantling monopolies, democratizing the economy, those were sort of some of the big trends that we were fighting against, but we weren't quite realizing we were fighting them. And so in, in 2010, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Copenhagen Climate Conference, I left my job at WWF, with whom organization I loved, it's excellent, um, and went to Greenpeace. Um, I was at WWF and they were doing like one of those corporate, like the organizational value statement, and we, everyone's in a room and you're going around, what, what makes you want to get up and get out of bed and come to work in the morning? And everyone's going around saying their thing and it comes to me and I'm like, well, I think, how am I gonna screw over the bad guys today? <laughs> this did not go on the flip chart. <laughs> I was informed it was not in fact a WWF value, which is totally fair. Um, and I moved down the street to Greenpeace. Um, so, uh, a year later, I got arrested on the lawn of parliament. Two years after that, I ended up chained to a fence of Kinder Morgan Terminal. Three weeks ago, I got escorted out of Finance Minister Christia Freeland's office in handcuffs. I really wish I remembered the name of that guy in the Christian government, because I really want to send him a note saying, now you see people getting arrested over climate change. <laughs> um, my personal change of employers was part of a broader shift within the movement from what we called inside game lobbying to outside game organizing. These two work best. They're not either or, they work best when they're in conjunction, but we were thinking we could do it all with inside game organizing. Um, and again, one of the things that helped hit this home for me was just after the, that Copenhagen climate conference, some reporter went and asked the top UN diplomat, climate diplomat, what he thought the environmental movement should do. And he, <laughs> he said, stop putting on suits and ties and pretending you're negotiators walking these halls, start throwing bricks through the windows. Um, so, Uh, we took off our suits and ties and looked, did a naming the moment type process. It wasn't exactly a naming the moment, but pretty a conjunctural type of analysis. And what we came up with was pipelines. Why pipelines? Oh crap, I keep forgetting to advance my slides. Um, so, <clears throat> 
Pipelines because that was where there was open space for organizing in a way that could challenge, challenge power and change systems. I've got a whole separate other presentation that I do on like the political risk calculation matrix for pipelines and how likely you are to be able to stop them. It was developed by George Hoberg. I actually use it in Greenpeace planning sessions. Um, but basically, pipelines were the weak point for tar sands expansion. They were stoppable. And by stopping them, we put a limit on how much oil you could get out of the tar sands and then how many new projects you could build. Um, extracting and refining oil and gas is the largest and fastest rising source of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. That rise has been driven entirely by the expansion of tar sands um, over the last 20 years. Um, but it isn't just the carbon being pulled out of the ground. It's also the way that 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 process cements the political power of the oil and gas industry in this country. I mean, they own Alberta and Saskatchewan, but the federal government is afraid of them. Look what's happening right now. Uh, and so <clears throat> pipelines were a place where we could build a crowbar, insert it into the machine. It's, they weren't the only place, but they were an important place where there was a, open space. Like on pipelines, there's a decision maker who had to say, there's a decision maker, like in the way the process works, there's a decision maker who has to say yes, which means they can also say no. A lot of things just slide through without anyone ever quite saying yes or no. In the US, the guy who had to say yes to a cross-border pipeline, like the Keystone XL, was a fellow by the name of Barack Obama. Congress couldn't touch that decision. It was the only freaking thing he could do without getting congressional approval. Not the only thing, but one of the few things he could do. Um, that's, you know, that, that yes or no is what political scientists call a veto point. Climate activists could actually get at this veto point because we could link, articulate concerns over threats to water to concerns over climate change. Threats to water are visceral. If there's something in the water, people know that is wrong. It's not explaining the greenhouse effect to them. It's not talking about the global warming potential of methane versus CO2, something they can't see, feel, or touch. It's like, if there's something in the water, you can't drink it, or it's going to hurt you and your family. Um, cult water is also incredibly important culturally, particularly to First Nations, indigenous people across the continent. Um, <clears throat> those concerns are also place-based. And pipelines have to go through new places where people aren't currently you know, getting jobs in the oil industry. They're being offered jobs to build a pipeline, but other jobs are threatened. And so before long, we saw environmentalists with law degrees or PhDs who traditionally were in back rooms in Washington and Ottawa. Um, working with frontline indigenous communities across the country, often following the lead of indigenous communities across the country, and even sometimes with ultra conservative ranchers. Before long, however, it was actually those frontline activists who were, it got into this with concerned over water, who were talking to policymakers in Ottawa and Washington about the threat posed to their way of life by climate change. Um, there was also a shift in the composition of the climate movement from a bunch of nerdy policy wonks with glasses like these um, to something much broader. And again, that key role of indigenous communities taking a leadership role because they have certain legal rights in Canada, for instance, which we don't have, but also they have these cultural traditions and that sense of connection to the land, which is incredibly important. Um, and they've been used to fighting because they have to fight for everything all the time. Um, so, when Stephen Harper, as Minister of Natural Resources, labeled everyone opposed to the Northern Gateway Pipeline as radicals intent on destroying our way of life, he thought he was singling out people like me. But the tens of thousands of British Columbians who worked in the forestry and fisheries industries, whose jobs would be at risk in the event of a spill, said basically, who, what, me? You're calling me a radical? I actually met with Joe Oliver once. It was the weirdest meeting I've ever had in my life. Um, and he was saying he'd just written the radicals letter, and so we met with him, and like, so, radicals, are you calling us radical? And he's like, no, no, not you. And I'm like, we're like, 
hold on, not us, who? <laughs> We're Greenpeace. Um, but you know, there was a moment in Nebraska where the university football team, I understand football is important in America, <laughs> gave back Trans Canada's advertising money and refused to put up their ads anymore because the Keystone XL pipeline was so unpopular with people who cared about football. Here in Canada, the Enbridge ride for cancer that happens every year, that fundraiser, in British Columbia for a couple of years, it was the ride for cancer. Tim Hortons stopped running Enbridge ads in their like online in-store screen things because it was just so controversial. This isn't just backroom lobbying. This was like across the country. But also there wasn't just a narrative impact. It wasn't all just about, you know, what's the narrative here. There was economic and political impacts. So when I changed my, I, I, I only, I, I reduced myself to one graph, one graph. You were so lucky. Um, so when I chained myself to that fence in 2013, there were 3.1 million barrels per day of tar sands output in production or under construction. There was, however, projects under development, including a lot of projects with all their fully approved and a bunch of under, under regulatory approval, all of which have been approved since, um, which would take that to 9 million barrels per day. So when I'm sitting to that fence, I'm looking at a tripling of the tar sands in 10 to 15 years. What's the plan? There are currently 3.3 million barrels per day of tar sands production. Now, 3.3 is more than 3.1, but it's a lot less than 9. Um, this wasn't only due to our campaign, the 2014 downturn in oil prices, but the pipelines were a big part of it because they were that choke point. They were that open space we could move into to actually have that crowbar twist it. Push it. What do you do with a crowbar? I don't know. Pry. We're going to pry. Okay, it goes this way. Um, and, you know, the oil industry at the time was complaining we were costing them $50 million per day. They spent a lot of money funding back. Like the ad campaign, the amount they spent on advertising is enormous. The amount they've spent on industrial espionage is significant. Um, and they've also been organizing front groups to try and do what environmental groups do. We actually got leaked to us the plan for TransCanada where they're actually like their whole like digital strategy and organizing strategy and that helped destroy their plans in Quebec because once it got leaked in Quebec, which had like all these prominent Quebecers that were gonna like be on side with this pipeline, all, everyone involved was like, nope, not us, we weren't gonna do it. Um, but they spent a lot of money fighting back and they called in some political favors. The Harper government started auditing environmental charities. Greenpeace, not a charity. The Alberta government passed a law banning protests against energy infrastructure and launched a public inquiry into anti-Alberta energy campaigns. I am proud to have been named more than once in that inquiry report, which ultimately found no wrongdoing. You should have read the draft, however. The draft was bonkers. Um, uh, but we mentioned the whole thing about how they refused to ever interview us, and if they actually said these things about us publicly, we could like charge them with defamation. Uh, this was messy and at times very nasty, but it did change the conversation and the balance of power. And I guess one of the things I learned from this, from a lot of years of failure to actually like move the needle in significant ways, was it'd be lovely if we could dismantle systems of power without the powerful fighting back. Uh, but any historians in the room will tell you that's not something that generally happens. This is not a new lesson. Um, Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave who became a leader of the anti-slavery movement, said it over 150 years ago, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. So now I'm going to turn to the, this question of where are we now? That open space of pipelines, it's kind of done. 
No one's proposing to build new ones. We stopped a bunch of them, Northern Gateway, Energy East, Keystone XL. We didn't stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline. It's coming into service soon. But it's late and way over budget, pointing out how bad an investment these types of things are. And nobody's proposing new ones, partially because they're not projecting that kind of growth in demand, but also because they know just how hard it would be to get a new pipeline built. Um, those victories helped prevent the construction of even more new oil infrastructure, which would have locked in high carbon emissions for a long time. But they were always a delaying tactic in our minds. Like it was playing whack-a-mole with pipelines was actually exhausting. Um, but part of what we're trying to do was to create space for the energy transition to kick into high gear and undercut the demand for oil, which is what's happening right now in a fast, whole bunch of fascinating ways. And I think the good news here is that the energy transition, a world historic shift from fossil fuels to low carbon energy, mostly renewable, is now underway. In the words of the International Energy Agency, a very conservative international body, it is unstoppable. The key question is, can we make it happen fast enough to avoid the worst impacts of climate change? And who's going to benefit from the new system that replaces it? So I can confidently predict that electric vehicles are going to replace gas-powered ones. It's still up for grabs, however, how much we shift from a transportation system dominated by cars to one dominated by public transit and active forms of transportation. Solar power is now the cheapest form of electricity ever. Um, solar and wind are cutting into the market share of gas and coal at an increasing rate, though we're still going to have to redesign grids to work differently to account for all this renewable energy. Um, heat pumps can heat and cool our homes and workplaces at a much lower cost than gas furnaces now. Um, these technological developments, however, aren't natural or inevitable. They're the product of specific policies in specific places to help nurture the weeds that were growing up there. Um, they were almost all of them the result of activist campaigns, of policies that sort of then turn these technologies into mainstream. And technologies, important to remember, are also always represent a change in social relationships. But a lot of these are now moving from local niches to global deployment. They are the weeds growing up in the cracks. So from my perspective, it used to be that the politics and the economics were against us. Um, but now, to be honest, we have the wind in our metaphorical sails on the economic side. And this is useful, but not decisive. The fact that low carbon options for new sources of energy, or even replacing older ones, are now the cheapest option does mean that the fossil fuel industry is forced to engage in politics to keep them away from us. In Alberta, Premier Danielle Smith placed a moratorium on renewable energy permits to try and shore up the market share for her political backers in the natural gas industry. Um, and she's now sort of brought in a bunch of new rules, which are vague, but they're basically designed to keep wind and solar off the grid and gas on it. Two weeks ago, my good friend, Doug Ford, um, his energy minister, introduced legislation to overrule an Ontario Energy Board decision that would have meant Enbridge Gas would lose market share to heat pumps. Now, this is incredibly nervy and arcane, but I found it fascinating. And if you want to go read the OEB report on the energy transition, it's like, could have been written by Greenpeace. Actually, they agreed with Greenpeace's arguments, which I was kind of, no one was more surprised than me. Um, I was following our lawyer who works there, and I'm like, really? Really? Um, but the OEB put out this ruling on, you know, because Enbridge says, here's what we want to do, and so we want to raise rates this much to pay for all this stuff. And the OEB came back and said, well, we need to phase out natural gas. So why in the world would we subsidize putting in new gas furnaces in new homes or developments when heat pumps can do the job at a lower cost to homeowners? Now, that decision came out at 6 p.m. on December 20th. At 10 a.m. the next day, the energy minister announced his government would pass legislation to overrule the OEB. This has never happened in Ontario history. And they actually have to pass legislation to do it, and they've just introduced the legislation in the House. Um, I was like, how did that happen so fast? <laughs> it's like, and then one of my buddies, 
our lawyer was like, ah, well, check out the uh, LinkedIn profile of the chief of staff to the energy minister. What was his previous job? He was a top lobbyist for Enbridge. Um, but, and, you know, this is, in terms of like, you know, losing access to new homes, that's a big deal for Enbridge, but more the overall logic of that decision, which is actually, we need government agencies to accelerate the transition and bring in policies that are gonna lead to basically people making the right decision. So we're not gonna expect every homeowner to go and replace their gas furnace with, pay for replacing their gas furnace with a heat pump. We're just gonna put heat pumps in in the first place because that's gonna be the, the only option or the best option for the people, person building the home. Um, but the key thing in all of this is that we're seeing the fossil fuel industry actually have to engage in politics to get something that they used to come to them automatically. This does not make them happy. Um, the type of politics they have to engage in are pretty clearly, you know, it's pretty clear that it's to benefit them. Uh, and it's, then it's easier for environmentalists to confront than when it's hidden behind what Marx used to call the veil of commodity fetishism. And the energy transition in all its messiness is creating all kinds of exciting new opportunities, spaces where we can play. And some of the people in this room may already be, or may in the future, be able to like make a living doing good things for the environment as part of building this different type of energy system that we need to provide the services that we need without frying the planet. Um, but this isn't just a question of, you know, like technology, heat pumps versus gas furnaces. Um, a lot of the things I spend my, a lot of my time on currently is trying to drive a wedge between finance capital and fossil capital. In plainer language, I'm trying to get Canadian banks to stop funding fossil fuels and shift their vast resources into climate solutions. Canada's big five banks have put over a trillion dollars into fossil fuels companies since the Paris Agreement was signed. The Royal Bank has written, oh, you know, we're gonna need to spend $2 trillion to achieve Canada's climate targets over the next 15 years. You spent a trillion dollars on the bad stuff, you know, in the last seven years. Like, suddenly $2 trillion for the good stuff doesn't look like that much money. Um, and basically, what I wanna do is I wanna get the big banks to betray, betray big oil. Um, it actually builds on an earlier betrayal where oil and gas threw coal under the bus. Um, so, you know, biggest supporter of the coal phase out in Alberta, that would be the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Because they wanted to replace them all with gas engine, gas fired generating stations. And now they're like, oh crap, we keep losing all the bid, like the auction bidding to gas and to wind and solar. Daniel Smith, moratorium now. Um, <clears throat> You know, I think we can actually get the big banks to portray big oil. Um, so do they, which is why if you track back where the policies came from, the funding came from for the Republican Party attack on ESG, environment and social governance in the US, it comes back to fossil fuel companies. They're launching an attack on, you know, environment, taking climate into consideration um, as a way to defend their market share. But they actually, they used to just have market share automatically, just belong to them. Now they actually have to get politicians to defend that for them. And that also means it's like a space we can move into and have that fight. And we're winning in some places, losing in others. Eventually we'll win everywhere. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that's also providing wind in our sails is actually climate change itself. When I sat in a lecture hall like this one in 1990, listening to Stephen Lewis, all of those things he talked about, those horrible impacts of climate change, those were future problems. When I started doing this, we said, do it for your grandkids. Well, uh, we're here today on a day where with 18 degrees in early March, um, 160,000 Canadians were driven from their homes last summer by wildfires. Um, this is no longer a future problem, this is a here and now problem. Um, <clears throat> And the, the way climate change is affecting people is in effect recruiting people for actions to stop climate change. Whether your concern is, you know, your kid going to 
the hospital with an asthma attack because of the fire, the smoke from those fires. Um, whether you're concerned about your home, losing your home because it's in a floodplain, or uh, what didn't used to be a floodplain, but now is a floodplain. Uh, if you're concerned about global justice, if you are concerned about wilderness and you're watching your favorite areas get burned to the ground, um, there's so many reasons for people to become involved. Yeah. Uh, it's just still a line from climate scientist Edward Carr. The most recent IPCC report tells us that transformation is now inevitable. The choice is between the transformations we choose and those forced upon us by the climate we have altered. We will have to make decisions about what we transform and who reaps the benefits and bears the future burdens of that transformation. Um, so we're going to jump back to my good friend Antonio Gramsci, uh, writing in his prison. He wrote, thinking about the rise of fascism in the 1930s, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. When I look south of the border, I see Donald Trump as one of those morbid symptoms, trying to defend a world that is slipping away and the power of, frankly, people who look like me, um, who are concerned that they're losing their, their authority, but also, I mean, the biggest backers of Trump are the oil and gas industry. Um, we're seeing it with Pierre Polyev here. We're seeing the rise of fascists and a strongly anti-science new right. Um, if you look at the organizers of the truckers convoy that shut down Ottawa, almost all of them were previously engaged in an earlier effort to have a truck convoy go from Alberta to Ottawa to complain about the carbon tax. It was all initially financed by the oil and gas companies who only kind of like pulled back because they wanted people to be angry and they want they like wanted like Trump, they just wanted people to be mad. And they stoked that anger and they like provided a bunch of the funding for it. And then they were like, ooh, you're actually saying things like, you know, like hanging Trudeau in effigy and saying a bunch of things I won't repeat here because they're offensive. Um, maybe we don't want that in the picture with like our logo on it. Um, but the, the front groups being organized by the oil companies, which I have to fight regularly, um, I mean, these, these are well-funded, sophisticated operations. Um, and we're seeing this intense opposition in legislation banning protests against oil, oil infrastructure that has spread from U.S. Republican states, where the Koch brothers, et cetera, sort of brought all that in, um, to Alberta. I could feasibly stand on a sidewalk in Alberta with a placard saying, shut down the tar sands and be arrested for being a threat to critical infrastructure. Um, we see it in the failed attempt to use a public inquiry to silence climate advocates by painting them, us, as foreign extremists, foreign fund, sorry, foreign funded extremists. We see it in the $30 million per year energy war room established by the government of Alberta to spread pro-oil propaganda. Um, all of that is terrifying. But the thing that is great to see, hopeful, is this rapid growth of the climate movement as the climate crisis touches so many people and the energy transition is taking off, offering a vision of alternatives and people could actually see themselves in that, as part of that solution. Um, we're seeing more and more people who see a reason why it's, there's something in it for them, there's something that they care about at threat, and they should join in this movement in some way. Um, and so one of the things that I think, again, reflecting on failures, one of the mistakes we've made as the climate movement is I think too often we haven't been terribly welcoming. Uh, too often we've demanded perfection, so if you aren't a vegan living in a solar-powered home who travels only by bike while wearing upcycled clothing, then you don't get to join. Um, you know, I get it. A, a lot of, probably a lot of us in this room, have put a lot of energy and money into trying to make the right choice in how we live. And making those choices actually aren't easy. When I was working at Oprah, the thing we were famous for was we were the people who kind of like invented and brought the reusable mug, the Oprah mug. 
because um, you couldn't buy those things back then. Um, but we aren't going to consume our way to a better world. You can't take transit to work if there's no bus. Or if the bus doesn't get you to work on time, or you can't afford to take the bus, and it's actually cheaper to take your car. Uh, we actually need to transform systems so that making the right choice for people and planet is actually, A, the choice is there, and it's the easiest thing to do. So you and I don't decide what furnace goes into a new housing division. But we could build super efficient housing, like super energy efficient housing, with solar panels integrated. We could do it with heat pumps, et cetera. You know, we could mandate that because overall it's better for planet and actually for the homeowner in the end who's going to face a lot lower energy bills. Um, but it's not like the consumer gets to decide what the developer is going to build in advance. You, if you're trying to buy a house right now, it's pretty much whatever the heck you can get. Um, and the other thing is, of course, like feeling guilty or trying to make other people feel guilty is something humans are particularly good at. It's comfortable. It's something we know well. Um, and sometimes it can actually be comfortable because it means we don't really have to try to do hard things because we're going to fall short of perfection, so why bother trying in the first place? Um, the fascinating thing for me that I've seen develop over the last number of years is that the other side knows this and they've actually weaponized it. Um, a few years ago, I was hanging from an 18-foot high tripod um, blocking the doors to RBC's main offices in Toronto. 18 feet doesn't seem like much, but I actually have a mild fear of heights, so that was pretty good for me. I actually like texted Stephen Guilbeau, environment minister, who climbed the CN Tower. She sent him a picture with like the CN Tower in the background of me, and I'm like, do I get to be Minister of Environment for Ontario now? <laughs> um, but while I was doing this, my Twitter feed was full instantly of all these people calling me a hypocrite and saying because my, the ropes were made out of nylon, which is a petroleum product. So. <laughs> If I was serious about climate change, I would cut those ropes and plummet to the sidewalk below. Ezra Levant, who I've had the distinct displeasure of debating a number of times, I no longer debate him because he's gone completely crazy, but I was on a TV debate with him once, and he started just, the weird thing is he's so charming in advance. He's like, oh, how are you? What's he going to say? Oh, you should make that point. It's a really good point. I'll say this, you say that. It could be great. You get on there, and he just like starts spewing. He's like, he's like you're a coward. If you had one ounce of courage, you would go to Saudi Arabia, you would say these things, you would be beheaded. You should be beheaded. <laughs> you are a hypocrite and a coward. Um, and I'm like, look, I got white guy confidence. Like, this is not going to hurt my feelings. And, it, and then I was like, oh, actually, I was watching this sort of happen repeatedly. It's like, this actually isn't about me. They're not actually, the audience for that calling people hypocrites is not, in fact, me. It's everyone watching this who thinks, maybe I can do something. It's like, don't even try. Uh, because if you do anything, you're going to be denounced as a hypocrite if you're not perfect. And no one can be perfect because we live in an imperfect world. Um, even more insidious is this notion of you can actually feel good about yourself for not trying to change the world because at least you're not a hypocrite like him. Um, I'm sure they workshop, they, like, they, they focus group this stuff, I'm sure. Because <laughs> uh, it's so consistent, the message is like boom, 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 boom. Um, but let's not do our opponent's work for us and welcome people to the movement in messy, imperfect, all too human ways. Individual choices are important, we should try and do the right thing, but Imagining you can perfect yourself and your life in a world um, that is so imperfect, in isolation from those systems that we all live within, is, something, is a neoliberal fantasy. Um, we need to change the system, and it's something we can only do together as members of a community, as voters, as people who talk to families and friends about these types of things. Now, I've identified a couple of places where I see open space connected to fossil fuel finance, energy transitions. I'm a little biased because these are the things I'm working on. Uh, that's why I think they're so important. And I get to work on them and doing something that I think I'm actually kind of good at, um, which is also fun. Uh, but a bit of good slash bad news is that the climate crisis is so big that there's actually something for everyone to do. Now, for anyone in the room younger than me, 
I apologize because the fact you've inherited this terrible mess isn't fair. It's partially my fault for not stopping it earlier, but I kind of feel like it's not all my fault. Um, but the fact that so much needs to be done, as Mary Anais, Anais Heglar likes to say, is also liberating. Because so much needs to be done, do what you're good at. If you're good at public speaking, go out and inspire people. If you're good at writing, find your audience. If you're an artist, there is so much that can be done to bring climate change to culture. If you're good with your hands, retrofit old buildings, build solar farms. I would just ask that whatever you do, do it with other people. Um, move into those open spaces that are already here now, or try and create some of your own. Um, but the gr best antidote to an climate anxiety, depression, according to all the research, is actually activism and doing something. Now, of course, it's much easier to say, get out and do something than to actually do it, or at least to keep doing it, because it can be scary and depressing. Um, if you work on climate change, it's really easy to get caught in the gap between the problem being so big and what you can do being so small that you just don't do anything because it's paralyzing. Um, and there is a massive public relations trying to tell you, yes, don't do anything, it is paralyzing. Watch Netflix. Um, so I'm going to wrap up by answering a question that I suspect a lot of you are thinking. Uh, I suspect people are thinking it because this is a question I get from the students I teach at the University of Toronto is, how can I possibly expect you to be optimistic about the future when there's so much bad stuff happening in the world, particularly right now? Um, how can you, I expect you to be optimistic? My answer is I actually don't want you to be optimistic. I want you to be hopeful. If you were a student in my class, I would actually have already made you read Rebecca Solnit on hope versus optimism, but apparently I'm not allowed to assign required readings for coming to these things. Uh, so bear with me. Because the distinction isn't just semantics. Optimism, in the sense I'm using it, is the belief that everything's going to be okay. At the extreme, it's toxic positivity. We don't need to do anything because it's all going to work out. Okay, if you are a middle-aged white guy, like me, maybe it will work out mostly. But uh, if I think about very small parts of my life, but when I look at climate change and the fact that it's 18 degrees out today and we haven't had any snow in Toronto all winter, and you look at the drought happening out in Alberta right now, um, you know, it's not going to be okay. It's op that kind of optimism is actually just the flip side of pessimism, the idea that, oh, well, it's, it's all going to turn out badly, so why bother trying? Um, Hope is a very different thing. It's the belief that everything is not all right, but that we can actually change the outcome. Social justice organizer Miriam Cabe actually describes hope as a discipline. Hope doesn't preclude feeling sadness or frustration or anger or any other emotion that makes total sense. Hope isn't an emotion. Hope is not optimism. Hope is a discipline, and we have to practice it every single day. It's about the practice of making decision every day that you're still going to get put one foot in front of the other, you're still going to get up in the morning, and you're still going to struggle. It's work to be hopeful. It's not like fuzzy feeling, like you have to actually put in energy, time, and you have to be clear-eyed. You have to hold fast to having a vision. It's a hard thing to maintain, but it matters to have it to believe that it's possible to change the world. Now, this kind of hope isn't actually a fragile thing. If you read Rebecca Solnit's various books, like she has this great line in one of them where like, you know, hope isn't like this delicate candle you have to shield against the breeze lest you be left alone in the dark. Um, hope is the ax that you use to chop down the door of the burning building you find yourself in. That kind of hope shoves you out the door. It's going to take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of Earth's treasures, and the grinding down of the poor and the marginal. Hope does it just means another world might be possible, not promised, not guaranteed. Hope calls for action. Action is impossible without hope. So 
to answer the question posed in the title of this little talk, which I actually hadn't, didn't have an answer to before when I sent in the title, and it's been causing me a certain amount of stress over the last few weeks. Um, what's next for the climate movement in Canada? I think our role is to go through the work of naming the moment we are in, to identify places where people can actually make a meaningful change that's going to help shift some of those systems. Um, we need to welcome people into the movement rather than hold them out. We need to take leadership from indigenous peoples who have actually been, have actually historically faced apocalypse on this continent and come through it. Um, we need to be, as people come through that door, we need to be like handing out these metaphorical axes. I say metaphorical axes. Please, no one quote me as saying we need to take, take axes and start hitting people because then I'll have the thesis on my front door. But we need to hand them the axes, but actually then point them to the open spaces where they can be swung to greatest effect. Because once people get the sense that they're, what they're doing is powerful, they want to keep doing it. Um, we're going to get a lot of stuff wrong as we do this, but hopefully we will continue to learn from our mistakes. And I would ask all of you to join us in this endeavor. Thanks, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you have.